Joining us now in studio is Kristen Eccles, who is a research scientist at Health Canada. Thanks so much for being with us. Oh, thank you for having me. Now, I think your background is interesting. You have a PhD in biology, but you also did your master's in geographic information systems. So how has that background informed your research in toxicology? I've always really loved environmental health, and it wasn't really until the middle of my undergrad that I realized I could combine my love of health and love of the environment in environmental toxicology. And so, completing my undergrad, I really realized that I needed to have the tools necessary to look at spatial patterns of contaminants in the environment because the contaminants that we are exposed to are so localized. And so that led me to do the Master's of Science in Geography, where I specialized in geographic information systems that really gave me the tools necessary, such as mapping, spatial analysis, spatial statistics, to be able to quantify patterns and relationships between sources of contaminants, exposure to contaminants for both humans and wildlife, and then health outcomes. Tell me what you love about the work you do. It's a really interesting field, and I really love the interdisciplinary aspect of it. The problems that we're facing today really require an interdisciplinary approach, bridging together different fields that have been experts in certain methods for a long time, such as geography using mapping and spatial analysis tools, with toxicology, for example, to really understand how, why, when, where people in wildlife are being exposed to these contaminants. What inspired you to combine geographic information systems with toxicology? I really saw a gap and my unique background being originally trained as a geographer, I felt like I could help to fill that gap. So in geography, there is a really strong spatial analysis and mapping aspect, but I didn't really see that in toxicology, but understanding how people are exposed to chemicals is so important for understanding what are the unique chemical mixtures people are exposed to and then how those mixtures combine internally and lead to an adverse outcome such as cardiovascular disease or cancer. So I imagine this is a challenging field. What keeps you motivated in it? I think at the end of the day, it's creating better risk assessments that help protect the health of humans and the environment. There's a lot of limitations in our current chemical risk assessment processes um, and the methods that I have been using and continue to use in my lab really help us to better understand what people are exposed to, so understanding localized exposure to chemical mixtures, which is important for understanding how out adverse outcomes are related to the chemicals that we're exposed to. What are some of the challenges you face in assessing some of the risks of chemical exposures? So one of the biggest challenges is basically a too many chemical problem. So there are many, many chemicals in the environment and we're exposed to them all simultaneously. However, a lot of our risk assessments have traditionally focused on chemical by chemical approaches. And this is not representative of how we're exposed to chemicals in the real world. We also rely on a lot of data from animal toxicity testing, um, which can be costly, can be unethical, and just doesn't meet the, the need to assess all of the chemicals that we're exposed to. So tell us, how does your approach help to overcome some of those challenges? One of the important approaches that we are using is an integrated aggregate exposure pathway with the adverse outcome pathway. And basically these are two frameworks. The aggregate exposure pathway is more about chemical fate and transport in the environment, looking at where chemicals are released or the sources of contaminants, and then how they get into the human body. This also involves some uh, physiologically based toxicokinetic modeling, understanding how chemical go chemicals go from an external exposure into an internal exposure at the organ of target. Then the adverse outcome pathway kind of picks up those concentrations and looks at the relationship between concentrations of chemicals in a tissue and the biological progression that happens at increasing levels of biological organization leading to that adverse outcome. And so these two frameworks together help us pin all of the information and data that we gather from both environmental toxicology and more basic toxicology in laboratory studies to help us inform on the relationship between sources of contaminants, exposure to contaminants, and then the related health outcomes.
So in those frameworks, you're talking about how are you employing computational and geospatial methods? These methods generate a lot of data. And so in order to turn this data into information that can be useful within a chemical risk assessment process, we need to use computational methods. And so in the AEP, or Aggregate Exposure Pathway, um, this would be methods such as spatial analysis, mapping, uh, geospatial statistics. And so those are some of the computational methods that we would use to um, better understand how chemicals move in the environment and how people are exposed. And then computational methods that really support the adverse outcome pathway, um, such as new approach methods, which are cell-based assay technologies that help us to better understand uh, perturbations at a molecular or cellular level, kind of like those precursor steps leading to the adverse outcome. And so using high throughput technologies, we're able to generate lots of data very quickly. And we need computational methods to kind of turn that data into information. And um, we do this by using dose response modeling, um, calculating uh, critical thresholds of exposure, calculating benchmark doses. And so that information can then be fed into a risk assessment that's then useful for policymakers. How can the information from your research help people kind of avoid the potential dangers of chemical exposures, or can it? One of the really unique properties of geospatial methods is that it identifies localized hotspots. And so it's actually kind of a good case scenario where once we identify the, the most impacted areas, we can then create localized and targeted interventions for addressing the adverse health outcome. Um, and so th this method really allows us to create these targeted interventions which are cost effective and kind of target the people who need it the most rather than applying kind of a blanket um, harm reduction strategy um, that maybe is not equitable. Oh, are you involved with doing those interventions as well? I'm not. Okay. Yeah, so I'm more in the wet lab and dry lab generating the computational data that are then used by people in the field. And so um, our data gets used by community-based monitoring programs to help inform them as well as help inform policymakers. So what recommendations would you give to policymakers to reduce the risk of chemical exposures at both a national and a global level? I think the onus can't just be put on policymakers. We really need to bridge the gap and strengthen the relationships between the policymakers and the data generators, such as myself. And so at Health Canada, something that we do is whenever we're initiating a study, we always go to our regulatory partners and say, what are your needs? What do you need from us? What type of data do you need us to generate to help you create the risk assessment needed to protect Canadians? And so by strengthening that relationship, I think, it ultimately leads to better quality risk assessments that are useful and that ultimately leads to protecting human and environmental health. Amazing research you're doing, obviously affecting everybody across the world. So it's very cool. Thank you, Kristen, for joining us. Great. Thank you so much.